what are you going to do with a person like this? We had her for four or five weeks. She was given antipsychotic medications that had Thorazine, Stelazine, had no effect on her. So he slows her down, knocks you out, makes you sleep. But when she was talking, it was the same thing was always there. I decided to meet with her every single day. So I, I had five days a week, but I was coming in. I had, I had no life then except for my work. So I would come in on Saturdays and Sundays too, and I would spend an hour, 45 minutes or an hour with her each time. And I decided that uh, I didn't understand at all what this was. But I decided I would try to uh, empathize with her. It's, it, this is like an early stage in my own development of a phenomenological approach to these things. I kind of believed in the idea that it's important you climb inside a person's world and try to imagine what it be, might be like to be them, even something really bizarre and extreme like this. So I sat with her hour after hour after hour, just talking to her about it and listening to her as she hooped and whooped and hollered, and listening to her explanations about the men, the man. She didn't have a whole lot more to say than just that. And if you ever, ever tried to stop her from doing this, get her to control herself, she would just start sh shouting, Truman, Truman, at the top of her lungs. So it was very unmanageable. But in the process of sitting with her, I made an effort to imagine what it would be like. What really would it feel like to like wake up one morning, perhaps, and your head is gone? You don't have it anymore. And not only that, these weird yellow rays, the rays were yellow, by the way, coming in the window and coming down through the chimney, and they're going right in your vagina. I'm trying to imagine being a woman. It goes right in there, starts climbing up, and then you've got this, and it's all of a sudden, something's taking command over your voice. You don't have control over your own voice anymore. You can't speak your thoughts. You don't even know what your thoughts are. Something else is speaking through you. It's a little bit like Schreiber, because Schreiber had this idea something else was th speaking through him in the thought, how nice it would be to be a woman. He was being taken over by something from outside. This woman's very similar to Schreiber, I think. So I just sat there basically imagining these things with her, trying to be empathic, try always trying to be nice. Nothing really changed at all for her, except I noticed that she was becoming attached to me. After two or three weeks, she began to smile when I would come in. Just a little tiny smile would be on her mouth. This makes me sad when I think about this. And then a little flush, a little flash of sadness when I would leave when it was time to go. But the content remained exactly the same. So, so I was just, I just sat there, did nothing more than spend time with her. I'm a believer, and if you don't know what to do, just sit and be with someone. Just listen, just be right there with them. And if nothing changes after a week, try five more weeks. And if nothing changes after five weeks, try a year of doing it. Maybe something will change or you'll get a clue. Anyway, after about five weeks, the authorities in, this, in the psych hospital where I was working in decided she was un unworkable. It wasn't improving, not responding to medication, nothing. So it was time for her to be sent to the state hospital in St. Joseph, Missouri for the uh, chronic, chronically mentally ill. And there was, it was going to happen. There's no way I could stop it. We, our, our system was a kind of short-term treatment unit. Usually kept people not more than a week. She had already had four or five weeks there. So I had to go in and see her. And I said, Sophie, I've got news for you. What's going to happen? What's that? <laughs> it would never stop. It would always be there. I told her she's being transferred to the hospital. And a look of sadness came across her face. And then something else happened. I remember her reaching over to me and putting her hands on my arm, like on one arm like this. And she'd never touched me before. And I, I didn't touch her. I didn't want to make it worse. I didn't know what was going to happen. I probably shouldn't have been reluctant to touch her. You have to touch people sometimes to make them feel that they're really there with you, or you're really there with them. But anyway, she says, promise me one thing, Dr. Atwood. Promise me, promise me. And I look with immense concern. Watch out for the warmling. Watch out for it. So it was like a protective thing that she was feeling for me. And, and it was an expression, even though it all sounds so crazy, and what the hell does it mean in all this? Um, it, it's a reflection of, of a progress that I had made in her caring about what happened to me and feeling I was someone who cared about her. And she knew she would never see me again. And, and it was a sad moment, really. But then something really weird began to happen. As she said that, watch out for the warmly, I started feeling this weird stuff my lower abdomen, like It freaked me out really badly. 
you know, because I, I, I realized that I might have messed myself up a little bit. I could try to get in there and like empathically enter into the world of the patient and imagine not having a head and imagine these rays zipping right up your body and putting some weird thing in your throat that takes you over. You can get so carried away with that that you can lose, you, you could begin to lose yourself and begin to get taken over by that. And it didn't last. I walked out of there and got a cup of coffee and the <laughs> brrr stopped. Thank goodness. I wondered about it. They turned off the machines here in New York. They were going to get me too, since I'm not going to be part of the separate, since I was going to be separating from, these are just thoughts, whatever it is. But I, I really think that it's, it's dangerous for a clinician to do that kind of empathy, especially when he doesn't have the faintest idea about what's being symbolized in the delusions. Once you realize what's being symbolized here, uh, you can have empathy for a person, but you don't get lost in the concreteness of their actual warmling rays and going into vaginas and little men in their throats and the whoop whoop holy Moses, stuff like that. And I didn't have that, I didn't have that understanding, but I do now. So here's what I think. I think she was Daniel Paul Schrager's sister from Germany. She was not related to Schreiber in any way, biologically, okay. But I think she came out of a very similar background. And I was able to pull together a few of her historical records from previous hospitalizations and got the following idea. She had a father just like Schreiber's father. The story was that there was a family with a, two or three brothers. She had been born in like 1910 or 1911 or something, right about the time of Schreiber's <coughs> publication of his book, it doesn't matter now that I think about it and uh, lived through both world wars in Germany. The family had lost everything. A couple of brothers had been killed in the military clashes. Um, the family had had to travel across uh, important parts of Europe, actually, um, like penniless nomads and beggars. But there was one constant in her young life, and that was her father, who was an enormously narcissistic man who insisted on total compliance, conformity, and surrender to every single thing he said and thought. And, and the price of not doing that would get you violently attacked by him. And her, her early childhood was a childhood in which she tried to be a very good girl and please her father in every way. That's all, that's all I really know. But that's what I see behind this idea of Truman, Truman and the Con Edison Company. Now, I don't know the details, but she was, became separated from her family. She couldn't tell me anything about this. The records didn't have anything. She came to America after the end of World War II, and it was the early 1950s where she began to have uh, psychological problems, and a long career in and out, bouncing in and out of hospitals began to take place. What had happened is she had lived for the previous six months in Manhattan and, and had managed to stay out of hospitals, had saved her money, I don't know where she got her money, and traveled on a bus to Independence, Missouri, to get her head back from Truman. She had had thoughts that Truman might be behind it since she first came to America. And that she, when she first came here, he would have been president, because it would be 19, late 1940s is probably what it was. I wondered about the, 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 uh, use of the use of the President Truman as the symbol of the, of, of the dictatorial, autocratic, invalidating father who insisted upon letting your, you him take over your mind and tell you who you were, tell, tell you what your thoughts were. Why is Truman the one that was chosen? I don't know for sure, but I speculate that it has to do with his name, Truman. Tru, if you spell it differently, T-R-U-E man. True man. The man with the truth. The man who has the truth that you have to swallow, the truth that is allowed to take over your own mind. So then let's go back to the idea that Truman took her head. Can you guys see it might be metaphorically, subjectively true? What does it mean to have your head taken? What if we don't get lost in the concreteness of it and say your head is right where it should be? Truman! You're telling her what's really real. But maybe her head has been taken. Let's, let's listen to it softly. Maybe, maybe what it means is her mind has been taken from her. Her ability to control her own thoughts, her ability to even know what she thinks and who she is. Her ability to speak with her own voice. That's the second theme here. There's a man that's been installed in her throat. It keeps her from speaking her own voice. A very important part of a person being who they are is the capacity to know your own thoughts and to speak your own voice. This, I think this is what's being symbolized here. So it's an injury of a takeover of her mind by her father originally. The full flowering of the experience of that didn't occur until later in her life. And it, just like the full flowering of Schraber's experience didn't until later in his life. But they have in common 
that they both became victims of uh, the, the authoritarian invalidations of a parent who demanded total surrender. Okay? I wish I had been able to work with her. I would have liked to spend five years with this woman. And maybe that little smile that came at the beginning and the sadness at the end and, and then the concern that she showed me would have blossomed into a deeper, loving human relationship. And then I would have tried to find ways to help her have her own thoughts. I don't know, how, I don't know what those ways would have been, but I would have wanted to create a setting with me where her head would be returned to her and where only her voice would be honored and be able to speak. There would be no Holy Moses. Okay? But I, don't, I don't know exactly how that would happen, but I would just trust that by pouring energy into it and time into it, it might be possible for something to happen that would point the way. So a patient like this, or like Schreiber, is, is done for in the mental institutions we have today. They're diagnosed as schizophrenic, they're medicated, and if they don't improve, they're put away. That's the way it is. Okay, we'll stop there today, guys.